Excellent. Thanks, everyone, for turning up. I'm going to be talking about quote unquote policy in hard times. So what I mean by this is how this recent energy crisis and change in economic conditions affects individuals' policy preferences. So from my background, I'm very interested in climate change and the environment. So there's going to be quite a heavy emphasis on this. But we are also going to think about this about social policy more broadly and redistribution as well at some points. So effectively, the context for this talk and some of my most recent research is this global spike in energy prices, the energy crisis that we're seeing that has hu had huge ramifications for many countries around the world. So we're going from a period of approximately two years ago where energy prices are 4xing, 5xing, even more at various points in time. And this has had quite significant material consequences for individuals in terms of increasing costs of living. Right? So we're seeing, particularly in Europe, a large increase in inflation, right? getting to double digits, which we haven't seen in many years. And a huge chunk of this is driven by resulting increases in energy costs for electricity, gas, fuel, and this kind of thing. So this is the kind of context of the economic conditions we're facing. And there's been policy responses by governments to try and subsidize energy bills uh, in response to this. But as we're kind of leaving the winter, we're kind of entering the point in time of whether we will actually continue to do this and how policy is going to look like moving forward. And particularly in the UK context, there's a lot of discussion now of whether these energy subsidies directly transferred to individuals will continue or not in the coming months. It looks like there may be some continuation, at least for the next three months. But then this will be important to think about as we move forward given people's experience of energy crisis and the continued impact on individuals' bills and livelihoods, how this is going to shape the policy arena from a public opinion perspective moving forward. So what I want to do in this talk is three things. So one, give you the kind of general scientific basis for how we think about this in terms of this potential trade-off between the economy and the environment. Right? How hard times potentially reduce attention and reduce interest in issues such as climate change, which are issues that need to be dealt with in terms of the longer run rather than the immediate costs. Then I'm going to talk about some research that I've been currently working on, which looks at how people's experiences and expectations about energy insecurity as a result of this energy crisis feeds in and shapes their policy preferences. And then finally, not thinking just about how we spend money, but how we raise money in the context of carbon taxation and how the energy crisis has potentially shaped the political support for this as well, particularly in terms of how we use the money from carbon taxation to um, bolster political support. So as I said, I want to kind of give the kind of big picture of the economy environment trade-off first to kind of orient us in terms of thinking why the economy matters for environmental, climate, and social preferences before I get into the more specifics of the UK data that I've been working on in the last few months. So effectively, there's a quite long-standing literature now that thinks about the extent to which people think there is a trade-off between continued economic growth, economic development, and dealing with climate change and the environment. Right? So this can take many forms. We can think about this from a degrowth perspective. We can think of this in a kind of hard times perspective, which is the type that I'll be focusing on, which is that people have limited attention to policy areas and limited resources. And if there is a decrease in these resources, then there may be a prioritization of certain issue areas over others. Put simply, if times are hard, then people will be more concerned with dealing with the hard times rather than long-run issues such as climate change and the environment that don't necessarily provide immediate benefits in the short run. So a lot of the policy literature and academic literature that first started to evidence this came about as a result of the global financial crisis in around 2008 towards 2010. Um, where literature and policymakers started to document that there may actually be this trade-off occurring, where there was less environmental concern, less concern about climate change in the immediate aftermath of these crises. Now, as we kind of progressed through time a bit more to 2016, 2017, then what we started to see in the scientific literature is a bit more contradictory or mixed evidence in this regard. 
So you have series of papers that start to actually see that actually economic conditions aren't really associated with decreasing environmental concern. Um, so if we look at unemployment rates in US districts, then this was not necessarily associated with decreases in concern. So the literature started off from this kind of strong premise of that there is this economy environment trade-off to becoming more mixed over time. Now, one thing we may be concerned with if we're thinking about unemployment in the 2010s is how much of this is actually a very strong economic impact on individuals' livelihoods and way of living. And so what we've experienced in the last couple of years is a return to more stark, sharp events that maybe make these trade-offs a lot clearer. So in research that was published a couple of months ago, I looked at the COVID crisis and whether this actually had some impact in terms of environmental and climate concerns. And there's kind of scientific reasons why this approach maybe is better than some of the other ways we've been looking at this on the data side. And effectively what you find is that looking within people, so having the same fixed people over time, there was a significant break in people's concern for climate change and the environment as a result of the COVID crisis. Um, effectively, what happened is that across a variety of ways of measuring this, so whether we should prioritize the environment versus the economy, whether the environment and climate change is the most important issue, or whether the environment or climate is the most important issue itself, there was a significant decrease in this, in this time period as a result of COVID. Right? So this provides some initial evidence that we should be thinking that very hard economic times um, that have meaningful impacts on people's livelihoods and experiences can lead to a deprioritization of the environment. So that was COVID. What I'm going to do now is kind of redraw our attention to some more recent work that I'm now doing on energy insecurity in the context of the current energy crisis. And unlike the, the work I did with COVID, which was focused quite clearly on climate and the environment, I want to kind of broaden our policy horizon to think of about a variety of different ways that energy insecurity can play a role. And so this is going from the very specific, which is policy directed towards the energy crisis in particular, to broader conceptions of policy that are maybe somewhat related in terms of issues of energy, uh, and in renewable investments, which is the climate change issue, to our broader conception of how we deal with shocks from a social policy perspective. Now, the key way I'm going to think about this, um, which is very different uh, from very often how we maybe think about this in very broad public opinion terms, is this is not so much about concern for the environment anymore, but it's very focused on policy, and it's very focused on policy in two distinct ways. So thinking about policy, whether it's compensatory, so compensation-based, or investment-based. Right? So this is important because these things work on different timelines. Right? So compensation is an immediate response to the issue at hand, often transferring resources, transferring material towards individuals, whereas investment is very often a longer-term perspective of how do we resolve the fundamental tensions and fundamental issues. So there's a long literature on this in the context of globalization, of thinking about how we deal with increasing trade openness and how economic competition can affect people's livelihoods, where you can either think of welfare transfers to compensate the losers of globalization, or you can focus more on investment in skills so that people are better able to compete in the context of globalization. So what does that look like for the three issue areas I'm going to talk about here? So in the case of energy, again, this is very specific um, and quite targeted in this UK case, which is talking about one, the energy bill support scheme, which was uh, a one-off transfer for individuals that was uh, effectively a deduction of their energy bills, to the investment side, which is dealing with the long-term fundamental issues, which is then ultimately investing in alternative sources of energy, so you're less vulnerable to the energy crisis. In the climate change case, this is focusing on compensation in terms of those who are affected by the negative consequences of climate change and investment again being ways to mitigate climate change in the long run. So if you're familiar with the climate change literature, this is more the distinction between adaptation and mitigation. 
And then finally, in terms of social policy, looking at direct transfers to individuals in terms of basic income schemes versus long-run investments in education that should make people less vulnerable to economic shocks through higher levels of skills. So these are the six outcomes that we're effectively going to be interested in, in terms of seeing how energy insecurity shapes these. How am I defining energy insecurity here? There's three dimensions that are of interest. So first is people's prior experience of energy. So from a kind of political science perspective, this is retrospective energy insecurity. So within the last 12 months, did you have difficulty paying your energy bills? So before the crisis really took hold. We have our more prospective measure, which is looking ahead to the next 12 months. Are you going to feel that you have issues in terms of paying your energy bills? And then there was also an experimental component which looked at how if you provide people different sources of information about the impacts of the energy crisis on energy bills, whether this changes their preferences or not. I won't talk about this today because this actually had no effect on people's preferences. And this may be not surprising because there's been so much media coverage of energy bills and how much they would go up that this was effectively priced in by respondents already. And for information experiments to work, there needs to be some updating of beliefs in order to change policy preferences. So what does this look like in terms of our kind of aggregate top lines when it comes to support for various policies? So first looking at the case of energy policy, uh, just to note, we have this 50% line here which determines whether there's support or majority opposition. If the blue reaches across this line, then it means there's majority support. If the blue is on the left-hand side of this line, then it means there's majority non-support. And so for the case of energy policy, very directly targeted to the specific issue at hand in the energy crisis, you see majority support, um, approximately 70%, both for compensation and investment. So there's not a distinguishing between these two different aspects in terms of short versus long run. If it's to deal with the current crisis, there is significant support. However, as we move away from the immediacy of energy policy towards climate and social policy, then we start to see some changes in what this looks like. So for the case of climate policy, what you see is that actually support tends to be more favored towards investment um, rather than compensation. And one explanation for this is that climate change investment actually has more of a link to energy policy than climate change uh, compensation, right? So mitigation very often involves changing the renewable, uh, changing the energy sources towards more renewable energy sources. Uh, and that's a kind of embedded component of this, whereas compensation for climatic events is less immediately relevant at this time. In contrast, you see a flip with regards to social policy. So for social policy, people have very strong preferences in terms of geared towards compensation, so immediate direct transfers to deal with short-run pain, versus longer-term investments that the payoffs are only going to be realized in the long run in terms of uh, decreasing vulnerability, increasing robustness towards economic shocks such as the energy crisis we've seen. How does this break down by individuals' experience, expectations of energy insecurity? Um, we'll get to that in one sec, but just again to note that this is effectively the pattern we see, right? For energy, across the board support. For climate, it's more about investment. For social policy, it's more about compensation. So in terms of individuals' experience of energy insecurity, uh, what we also see is that the extent to which it matters does depend on the issue area. So for context, our y-axis here, so how high or low the points are, is what proportion support this particular policy. So again, this 50% line, if things are above this, this means the majority support taking action here. Um, whereas if it's below that line, then there is not majority support for this particular policy area. And what we do as we move along for each panel is look at those who are not energy insecure, right? so didn't have difficulty paying their bills in the last 12 months, compared to those who did have difficulty paying their bills in the last 12 months. And so while we see that generally there's a positive gradient, so those who were energy insecure have a higher level of support for many of these policy issues, it doesn't really make too much of a difference 
in terms of the overall level of majority support apart from the case of social policy. Right, so both the energy insecure and secure are all generally in favor of doing something about energy. Um, whereas with climate, they're generally in favor for investment, but there is a stronger kind of emphasis for compensation um, amongst those who are energy insecure. But again, this is not significantly different from majority support or opposition. Whereas when it comes to social policy, there's a clearer uh, bifurcation where those who are energy insecure are very in favor of uh, transfers, those who are not, uh, th those who are energy secure, th so don't have difficulty, are relatively indifferent, but neither have any real strong preference in terms of actually dealing with investment in this case. If we look at expectations, then we see a similar pattern, but we see a much stronger difference in terms of uh, comparing the two groups. So what we're seeing is that um, these differences in support are on orders of magnitude of roughly 15% or so in the case of energy. So while there is still overall majority support, it almost gets close to unanimity when we're looking at those who are energy insecure. And again, we see clear differences start to emerge in the social compensation area where those who do not have difficulty coming up in terms of uh, energy insecurity actually are not in favor of compensation on average, whereas those who are e expecting energy insecurity uh, are much more strongly in favor. We can also break this up in terms of identifying people's trajectories, so distinguishing between those who are always energy insecure or always energy secure, those who transition in and out. Um, and effectively what the picture tells us here is that really a lot of the movement is driven by prospective energy insecurity rather than retrospective energy insecurity. So these green points uh, being those who are expecting to be energy insecure, these typically tend to be higher throughout. And again, you see the same pattern here where those who are always energy secure, so have never had difficulty with energy insecurity being opposed to transfers, whereas those experience, uh, expecting energy insecurity to be quite in favor of this. So effectively what this is saying is that these changes and these experiences um, of energy insecurity play a large role in terms of one, which issue areas are prioritized, but also how the form of policy action in an area, issue area should look like. So there are strong kind of divergences between compensation and investment for those issue areas that are not directly linked to the current crisis, which is climate change and social policy, but there's general strong support in the case of policies that are directly linked to the current crisis, which is energy. So just to finish off with one small part on this. So, so far I've talked a lot about how people effectively want money to be spent, how people want action to be taken, but it's always useful to think about the flip side in terms of whether people support actually increasing taxes in order to take these actions. And so I'm going to talk about this in the context of a carbon tax, as this is one of the most kind of politically conten contentious policy instruments for achieving change in climate change, uh, but is one of the strongest in terms of policymakers uh, and economists' suggestions in terms of actually making a meaningful difference. So I'm going to be talking about this in the context of the energy crisis um, in the UK, but there's been, again, a history of contention and opposition towards carbon taxes or increasing taxes on fossil fuels in general. And the most notable example of this, of course, would be the Gilets jaunes movement from about five years ago now, where the uh, current French president was planning to increase fuel taxes, but this led to large protests on the streets, uh, which ultimately led to these tax increases to be rescinded. Now, a emerging literature uh, on this issue thinks about how we can design carbon taxes in a way to avoid issues such as this. And so in a paper from about four years ago now, um, both I and a co-author focused on this with the idea of very important in these issue areas is not just that you have a tax by itself, but taking the revenue raised from a tax and using it in ways to increase political support. And so in this paper, what we found was that the two main ways that you can actually boost support in these contexts 
actually are kind of directly linked to what we talked about just a moment ago in terms of design and policy. They're either compensation, which is giving a tax rebate to everyone so that people are shielded from the price increases, or it's investment in renewable energy. Okay? Um, and so what I wanted to do in this next part is to see, do these two forms of revenue recycling continue to matter in the current context where investment may be a bit more contentious and where there's even more uh, pressures on people's households that may reduce support for carbon taxation. And so this was done again in an experimental setting, uh, which means that this quote unquote control condition here is if you have a carbon tax with no stipulation of revenue usage, we have a carbon tax where there's a stipulation that this will be used to invest in renewable energy. And then there's also the condition here, which is the rebate, which everyone gets some money back. So the compensation based argument. And so again, our 50% line here is going to distinguish between whether there's majority support or not. Those above have majority support. And so what you find in this more recent context is that the revenue recycling mechanism through investment no longer significantly boosts support for a carbon tax. So individuals are pretty indifferent between a carbon tax that has no revenue spending or no revenue stipulation versus uh, investment in renewable energy. But tax rebates continue to work in terms of boosting support for carbon tax to the extent that you still are able to get a majority support for this more controversial measure. Right? So in terms of an actual treatment effect, this is a probably approximately 12 percentage points, so quite large in magnitude. Additionally, this also depends on trajectories with regards to energy insecurity. And what you find is that the one group that tends to prefer renewable investment rather than a rebate uh, is actually those who are currently entering energy insecurity that were previously secure. So these may be individuals who expect that they will, this is a kind of one-off change in terms of energy prices, and they'll be better kind of place to take advantage of investments in the future. Um, but apart from this, most people actually still favor the rebate in these regards. So that's been a kind of broad overview of both my research and also the broader understanding of the literature in terms of how we think about policy preferences in terms of times of energy crisis. And so to wrap up, the basic challenge is, is that the economy environment trade-off does suggest that we have to be mindful how changes in energy prices, changes in cost of living pose real challenges for policy when we're thinking about things that will ultimately be costly and have long-term kind of benefits. And so what we find is that energy insecurity does shape individuals' policy preferences, both in terms of which policies receive most support, but also the types of policies within a given issue area. Um, and in this regard, there is uniform support for energy policy at a high level across uh, the issue areas, but that leads to a divergence in terms of uh, more attention towards uh, investment and climate change, uh, whereas for social policy, um, there, this focus is more on direct compensation. But then if we make climate policy more costly in terms of introducing a carbon tax, then investment no longer has its appeal as it had previously in terms of boosting support, but they can still be achieved if we focus on these measures such as tax rebates that shield people from the immediate economic costs of carbon taxation. So that was my talk on this kind of broad issue of energy insecurity, hard times and policy preferences. And I'm looking forward to hearing your questions. Um, yeah, so I mean, I've been long interested in this kind of economic aspect of climate policy and environmental policy for a while, um, partly because at least when looking at a public opinion policy preferences perspective, it always struck me that there was too much focus on whether people are concerned about climate change um, and whether we should do something about it but not as much about like what this looks like in terms of dollars and cents, right? And we know that as soon as there's some monetary cost uh, 
then very often people's willingness to engage with things starts to decrease. And so that's why I particularly was focused a lot on carbon taxation for a while because this is the most obvious glaring example of where climate action will have a dollar cost and will have a strong impact on people. And so then naturally as kind of events have unfolded with the energy crisis where effectively you've been seeing these price increases without a carbon tax in the first place, understanding how people respond to them and understanding how it shapes their preferences is a really interesting avenue to do. To discover, yeah. Yes, okay. uh, maybe it, it'd be interesting to see what role insulation in the sense of bureaucratic autonomy plays in, in your picture, right? Mm -hmm. Because if you think about more democratic policy making versus yeah. technocratic or authoritarian policy making, then we, we could see some changes in, in, in this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's a, a very important point that effectively. What this research on public opinion and policy preferences is doing is almost kind of setting the field of kind of a range of things that are acceptable, but then the extent to which this actually translates into policy is then going to be mediated right through the extent to which you have more democratic institutions, um, right? So some countries have very direct democratic institutions. So in the case of Switzerland, with referenda recently on climate issues, this is very important because this is a direct kind of translation of this. But also understanding how public opinion kind of poses constraints in autocracies is another area where this is really interesting as well. Yeah. We're also authoritarian in democracies, right? Yeah, and okay, yeah, so you mean in terms of issue areas where yeah, there are more technocratic approaches, such as you know, independent central banks is one example, right? Yeah. 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 yeah thanks for a very interesting talk. So I think there's been some recent research showing that in practice, exposed these rebates don't actually improve support that much, and there are mm -hmm. all sorts of issues with how to communicate with yeah. those And more generally, I'm wondering how much do you think your experiments have, let's call it, realistic uh, validity or real-world validity in terms of when the economic impacts of carbon price actually felt and how much these rebates will actually... Because it seems like it's such an obvious mm -hmm. solution that every policy should make, policy make should follow. Yeah. yeah, so I mean the rebates research is, is very interesting in that regard and I think it's very clear that this is a huge issue of communication, right? So in the kind of experimental setting, these are very clearly and cleanly communicated to individuals. Whereas in the rebates case in the real world, very often policymakers don't actually feel the need to communicate it that much. So the most obvious example, right, so this is the Mildenberger et al. paper I guess you're talking about, where they look at rebates in Switzerland, where effectively this is like a line item in your health insurance premiums. So it's the extent that I didn't even realize I was getting a rebate when I was living in Switzerland. It's that opaque. And again, this is both um, on the rebate side, but then also in the cost side, the area of when this plays out in the real world in terms of communication is incredibly crucial. So in the Canadian case then, um, in Ontario, there were the stickers on the fuel pumps about how your prices are gonna be increasing by this amount over the next couple of years as a result of carbon taxes. Um, communication then is, is really key, right? So this serves as kind of the benchmark maybe as what is the potential lift, but the actual lift that you get is gonna be dependent on how you communicate it and how effective this communication is in the real world. But essentially you believe that this kind of lift is achievable with the right communication in real world? Of course. If people see money in their bank account, it makes a whole big difference. Okay, last one. <coughs> to what extent do you think that um, those policy preferences have been or will be taken into account by uh, policy makers in countries such as the UK or maybe other countries? So I think in the energy crisis case, I think it's very clear that there is quite a bit of hesitancy right now in terms of rolling back some of these subsidy schemes, exactly for this reason. Right? So this is why originally the plan was come April to discontinue the, di the direct energy support schemes, but now we're having discussions of smoothing this out further until July uh, to kind of take advantage of the energy prices continuing to fall over that time frame. I think, and hopefully 
things permitting, they'll be doing some more research on this. What's going to be interesting is what happens come next autumn, next winter, where it's very likely you're going to see increases again, and how policy is going to be responsive to that, right? So one, in terms of if it's just going to quickly move in terms of uh, continuing to subsidize individuals, and then if we're thinking even further down the long run, how are we going to be paying for these direct compensation schemes that are kind of not funded through increases in taxes so far?